record. Okay, so now you can all see my screen. Let me go ahead and press present there. Perfect. So before we begin today, I first of all wanted to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm coming to you from today, which is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to those elders past, present and emerging. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight or today, depending on your time zone. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is all of these different ways that you can reduce reduce plastic consumption in your home. So there is going to be a lot that is covered. Um, we're going to talk about the great ocean cleanup, different waste streams in different areas of your home, and then really give you some different um, actionable steps that you can take to reduce your plastic consumption in particular. And of course, touch on recycling because absolutely everybody seems to love recycling. If you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I will answer them at the very end of the session, or you can also just hold on to them and then we can ask, we'll have a bit of time for question and answer at the end of it as well. So I'm sure all of you know that it is the sixth day of July, which means it's the sixth day of Plastic Free July today. Um, it's very exciting. We had a couple of statistics to go over to you first, uh, to go over with you first of all. So that is that in a single year, the average Australian discards 130 kilos of plastic. We're one of the biggest consumers of plastic in the whole entire world. But um, every, every year humans produce 300 million tonnes of plastic waste, which includes 11 million tonnes that will eventually end up in our oceans. It's a scary couple of statistics, but in exciting and positive news, last year 140 million people took part in Plastic Free July. And hopefully this year I'm sure we will get many more participating. So this movement that was started by the amazing Rebecca in Perth has literally gone global and is taking over the world. So it's really exciting to see um, how everything has expanded over the last few years and how it, sustainability is really becoming front and centre for so many people, not just in Australia. So a little bit about me. I am Lottie, the founder of Banish, which is an education platform and an e-commerce store that helps Australians reduce their waste. I was that person back in 2019 that wanted to do something when it came to the planet, but I really didn't know where to start. I'd heard of all of the gloomy statistics, everything about kind of turtles with straws up their noses and all of these different bits and pieces, but there was nobody out there and no place that you could go as an everyday Australian just to learn those simple steps on how to really take action and how to really reduce your consumption. So I created that. So Banish is both an education platform. So we teach people daily about what they can do when it comes to helping our planet, but it also connects Australians with amazing small businesses. So we've got over 70 different brands on the platform. So you can go there and you know that they have been individually vetted to meet sustainability credentials and standards that a lot of these small businesses can't, um, they can't meet the big ones like B Corp certification or Australian certified organic. So we do all of the hard work so, so that you don't have to. Um, so I started back in 2019. In 2020, I delivered a TEDx talk, which is called The Power of Community in Fighting Climate Change. In 2021, I launched Brad, which is Banish's recycling and disposal program that recycles hard to recycle household items. So people literally put in a shoebox all of their hard to recycle items like blister packs, beauty products, coffee pods, and they post them to us in the mail. We started in 2021 and we get about 1,200 parcels sent to us every month. We have an amazing team of volunteers who come in each and every weekend and they open up the shoeboxes and they sort them into the different um, waste streams. 
In 2023, I was named the New South Wales Young Australian of the Year and also as one of Forbes 30 Under 30 for social impact across Asia. So that's a little bit about me, but let's talk about the fun stuff today, which is plastic. So the thing about plastic is it is actually a really great invention. It can be molded into all of these different shapes and thicknesses and sizes, and some of it can be springy and some of it can be really firm. It's really easy to clean so it's great to be used in a medical setting there were all of these amazing things that we could kind of unlock when plastic was invented but the biggest thing that we didn't think about when it came to plastic was how to get rid of it and the biggest issue and the biggest design flaw is that plastic doesn't go away every time that we recycle something we don't actually recycle plastic what we do is we downcycle it so You have your virgin, I don't know, plastic bottles, for example. And then when they're recycled, they actually become a lesser quality material. So in general, you'll only get three to four uses out of plastic before it becomes such a low grade quality that you can't actually recycle it again. Like, I don't know, your gym leggings that are made from recycled plastic bottles, those kinds of things. Whereas if you look at something like glass or aluminium, they can be infinitely recycled. So what that means is that every time we use glass or we recycle aluminium, it stays and it can it can kind of sits at that high level of um, a good quality. So it's really, really great. But plastic, on the other hand, it just degrades and it degrades in quality. What also happens to plastic when it is kind of, I don't know, in your washing machine or it's kind of in use every day or it ends up in the ocean and underneath the sun, it breaks down into smaller pieces. So microplastics are defined as a piece of plastic that's smaller than five millimeters. And we're starting to see now a lot more research that's coming out that is showing that microplastics are literally absolutely everywhere. They're in the fish that we're eating, they're in the water that we're drinking, they're in the air that we're breathing. Scary statistic came out two years ago by the University of Newcastle and that showed that the average Australian is eating five grams or a credit card's worth of plastic every week. So that's pretty much like instead of an after dinner chocolate, you're having an after dinner credit card's worth of plastic. It's a really, really scary statistic. And we don't know a lot right now about the health implications of consuming this much plastic, but we know that it's probably not going to be as good for us as having something like a little bit of broccoli. So what I wanted to touch on, I was going to show you a video about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but because we came in a little bit late, I'm going to just instead talk about it. So I'm not sure how many of you have heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but it is this accumulation or this mass that sits in the oceans between Hawaii and California. And what it has done is it's accumulated as all of the different ocean currents have come around. And what has happened is... Um, Sorry, I was just reading Jenna's um, comment, but I will respond to that in a second. So what happens is this accumulation of the plastics creates these pretty much islands and these islands are sitting there and they are these accumulations. So we've got six of these different patches, what we call them, in the ocean. This one is by far the biggest one. It's made up of 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic, which is pretty much like the size, the geographic size of it is actually three times the size of France. So this is just sitting there in the middle of our oceans. What I, why I like to talk about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is because even though most of it is made up of things like fishing nets and, as you can tell, like different things from commercial fishing and other bits and pieces, but what I really, really like to talk about this is it's a really good visualisation of the fact that the plastic that we consume does go somewhere it doesn't just magically disappear when we put it in the recycling bin or when we put it in our curbside landfill bin so it's really important to remember that all of the plastic that we consume does go somewhere in positive news there is an amazing 
organization called the Great Ocean Cleanup, which was started in um, by a fellow in the Netherlands called Byron. I'm going to pronounce his last name wrong, Slash, I think. Um, but pretty much what it is, is it's going out there into the middle of the garbage patch and it is trying to tackle it and pull it out, sort it out, figure out what's going on there and how that they can actually reduce this accumulation from falling, so forming. So you can kind of see the... Um, the slingshot that they've got in between these two tugboats here that's pulling out all of this plastic that's in the middle of the ocean. I actually had the pleasure of interviewing a guy from France who swam from one side of the patch to the other when he was tr um, to kind of raise awareness about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And I asked him, I was like, what was the most fascinating, like funny thing that you saw in the middle of the patch? Thinking that he'd be like, oh, I don't know, I saw lots of like rubber thongs or I saw a lot of this. And what he actually said was that he saw so much wildlife. There was dolphins, there was whales, there was so much fish there that are literally just using this as an ecosystem and feeding on the plastics. So very devastating, very scary, but there is an amazing organisation that is tackling this. They are, this organisation is also going into Indonesia and helping to clean up all of those waterways as well. So they're doing great work. So what I wanted to talk more about today is how you can make a change. So what I'm going to do in this next section of this presentation is I'm going to talk through each room of the house. I'm going to suggest maybe five or six different ways that you can reduce your consumption in each of those rooms. But what I want is I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. What I would really love is for you to be able to take away one or two things from each room and to go and implement those changes. We're all at different stages in our journeys and we're all at doing different things. So don't compare yourselves to one another, but just pick a couple of things. And please don't be so inspired from this presentation that you go into your bathroom and you clear out all of the shelves and you go, that's it, I'm finished with plastic. Use up everything that you've got already at home and then make the changes. Be organized and make those switches. So the first place is inside your home. That's bringing what you're bringing into your house. So this comes to when you're at your groceries, when you're doing your grocery shop, for example, making plastic free, buying plastic free fruit and veg, not veg veg, but you do need your you do need to buy more veg than fruit. So buying your plastic free vegetables, using things like beeswax wraps are really amazing instead of using cling wrap. Um, also, again, talking about those microplastics that are breaking off when we're using things like plastic sponges and plastic dish brushes, every time you're kind of scrubbing aggressively and using all of that elbow grease, you're breaking off tiny fragments of microplastics unknowingly. So making a switch to something like a bamboo scrubbing brush or using cotton dishcloths or ones that are made from a cellulose, which is a plant fiber, are really simple and easy switches. When you are in the supermarket, making those um, switches from plastic packaging where you can like I don't know, buying pasta in a box or going without altogether or buying things in tin or glass. All of these little things, they may seem so insignificant, but they are really making a big difference. And a lot of people always ask me, they're kind of like, well, shouldn't we have like a, a top-down approach where we have the big supermarkets that are then going, well, we're just not going to offer things that are wrapped in plastic packaging or it's going to be made from recycled packaging and I think that is great but I think also as individuals we have so much more influence than we realize and you can vote with your dollar so by voting with your dollar you're able to make so many changes and really drive up the change by buying those loose carrots every week if we all start doing that they won't have as many carrots in plastic bags available because they won't be selling as many and it's just telling them what we really really want in your bathroom, this is probably one of the hardest rooms to change, I would say, just because there is plastic everywhere and our consumption, we do consume so much. So again, remember when you're finished with something to then make the switch. But what I also like to think of in the bathroom is I really like to mirror my grandma's old routine. It's nothing innovative, but it's just really going back to basics, like using things like I don't know, bars of soaps or safety razors or using a flannel instead of using single-use makeup wipes. All of these little things aren't innovative, but they're just really going back to those basics and making those small, simple swaps. The same with bamboo toothbrushes. So it's estimated that every 
toothbrush that exists on this planet, it will take probably between three to 400 years to break down, which is ridiculous. We don't exactly know because plastic toothbrushes haven't been around for 400 years, but that's the estimate about how long it's going to take de- take to break down. So swapping to something like a bamboo toothbrush is a really simple and easy switch that you're going to use every day and you're making such a big improvement. Now, the laundry is probably one of the simplest ways to have the biggest impact. So what you probably don't realize is when you do a load of laundry, if you're wearing clothing that is made from synthetic materials like that are plastic, so like your synthetics, your polyesters, things like that, when you wash your clothes, you're actually breaking off more of those microplastics. So a couple of ways to reduce the number of microplastics that are breaking off in those washes is to slow down, slow down that spin cycle. So rather than having the really, really aggressive spinning, you're going to slow it down. You're going to cool your the water that you're using so it's not going to break. Your clothing's not going to break as fast. It's going to last longer. And you're going to really fill up that wash cycle so that it's not going to have as much breakages happening. Another simple one is hanging your washing out. Again, you're not getting all of that lint in the, um, in the dryer. Stainless steel pegs are probably one of my favorite swaps. They are so simple, so easy, and they work so well because, you know, those plastic pegs, they just crumble in your fingers and they pretty much disintegrate into the microplastics before your eyes. And I've tried the bamboo pegs and then they rust on my clothes and things like that. It's not, not ideal. And then we've got on the go. So this is the pretty much the exact method and ethos of Plastic Free July. So On The Go is all about those eco-friendly essentials and having your single-use quitter kit ready to go. So inside mine is a reusable coffee cup, a water bottle, reusable cutlery. If you don't want to buy any fancy cutlery, you don't need to. You can just go into your kitchen drawer at home or the drawer in your office, grab that cutlery out. I've also got a really fun set that I just picked up from an op shop that's all vintage, quite cool. Um, A reusable container is really great and really simple. I know that people feel really quite disheartened or feel scared to go into vendors and kind of say, can you please put something in this container because we got rejected so much during the pandemic. But people are accepting your reusable containers. I today had sushi out of a reusable container and they didn't even bat an eyelid. They gave me a dollar off. So all of these simple things just make such a big difference. And it's just about changing that behavior. And by using your reusables, you're also signaling to everybody else in that line that it's okay, and then you're reminding them to bring theirs next time as well. So think of yourself as a bit of a role model. And then when we're at work, so you spend about 14% of your life in the office. That's when we're looking at kind of like a two or three day a work, three day a week in the office kind of equation. Um, So a couple of ways to reduce your consumption at work are to be greening up your commute. So walking, catching public transport or carpooling, You don't need to use your printer as much. Again, remembering all of those reusables and we love an online meeting to reduce our our environmental footprint. So a couple of key terms that I want to kind of talk about and touch on quickly is these ones that I'm starting to see pop up a lot more. So we're seeing greenwashing happening. And what you might not know about greenwashing is greenwashing is when brands or marketers kind of splash these terms all over the place to perceive or to to show us that they're doing the right thing when it comes to the planet when they're really not. So the biggest ones that I see with greenwashing are the kind of the terms green, natural, eco. They really have no substance behind them and they really mean nothing. There's no third-party certifications or anything. So I'm really cautious when brands put this labelling all over their products. The other one that I want to talk about is the difference between recycled and recyclable. So they're very similar, but they mean two very different things. So recyclable means that it can be recycled in most curbside recycling bins. I'd be checking with the ARL label. And then recycled may means that this has been made from recycled materials, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it can be recycled. So it's very confusing and very tricky. On that confusing and very tricky, there used to be the three R's, there's now nine R's. And I want to talk about this just before we head into the recycling section of this talk, because 
we love recycling as Australians, but you can see on our new nine R's of re- of the nine R's of consumption model, recycling is at this is the second bottom. We've got rethink, refuse, reduce, reuse, regift, repair, rent, then recycle, and then rot. So I think these first three are the ones that we're really seeing and we're really focusing on this month for um, plastic free July. When it comes to recycling in Australia, we're kind of like sitting in between the linear and the recycling um, economy. The moment we've got a lot of linear, which is kind of like the take, make, waste model. And then we've also got a little bit in that kind of recycling economy where we take something, we recycle it into something else, but then eventually that's going to end up in landfill because as I mentioned at the start, you're only going to get three or four uses out of that plastic material. What we're really looking towards and we'd love to move to in the future is the circular economy. That's when we're keeping the same things in reuse over and over again and we're not having to have anything going to landfill. So say things like using a reusable coffee cup that you can use over and over and over again. That's what we want to see more of. So when it comes to the different waste streams in your home, this is just like a rough guide of how I want, how I like to set things up. So you've got your yellow bin, which is your generally your curbside recycling bin. You've got your curbside landfill bin or your red bin. You've got your compost bin, and then you've got your odd bits and bobs. So these odd bits and bobs, we really want to make sure we are keeping out of landfill at all costs. Things like batteries, light bulbs, e-waste chemicals, vapes, all of these things really, really, really need to be kept away from landfill, but also from curbside recycling. Curbside recycling batteries and e-waste are often going to to set things alight, like recycling plants or recycling trucks, but also in landfill, they're all going to leach these toxic chemicals into our waterways and into the ground, which we really, really don't want. You can use the RecycleMate app. It is being rolled out across Australia. It's a really, really great resource. What you do is you literally scan the back of the of an item, scan the barcode, and it will geolocate you into your council area and say, yes, you are in South Yarra. You can put that in your purple bin or you are in Redfern. You can put that one in your yellow bin. It's a really, really great resource and something that I would highly recommend. And now... What I want to do is I want to finish off with three questions before I open it up to everybody to ask lots of other questions. So in the chat, please, can you put the answers A, B or C to this question, which is how many kilos of plastic enters the ocean every hour in Australia? Just going to wait for a couple of people to jump in and respond. We've got A, 580 kilos, B, 1,580 kilos, and C, 15,800 kilos. Got a couple of A's, got a couple of B's. Drum roll, please. The answer is B, 1,580 kilos. Quite surprised by all of your answers. Normally when I ask this question, we get lots of people who answer C because they're just so upset from the rest of this presentation. And they just go, oh, I just, I just thought it was going to be C. But that is great. So now for question two, How many coffee pods do Australians use each and every day? So is it 60,000 coffee pods? Is it 600,000 coffee pods? Or is it 6 million coffee pods? Pop in the chat again what you think the answer is, A, B, or C. couple of A's, couple of C's, no B's. So the answer to this one is C, 6 million coffee pods a day. We are absolute coffee addicts in Australia and we guzzle it down. And this is just the coffee pods. This isn't even talking about the single-use coffee cups or anything like that. Huge, huge statistic. And now the last one is an open-ended question. So if you want to pop in the chat your your guess, then that would be great. So what is the biggest source of ocean trash? We're talking by quantity, not by weight. So what are we seeing the most of when it comes to ocean rubbish? 
So could be lots of different single-use items. What one is it going to be? Plastic bags? Nope. You all guessed the same one. Fishing line? No. Bottles? No. Plastic takeaway cups? No. Couple more guesses before I give it away. Not cans. Not tires. Not packaging. Cigarette butts. Yvette, you were right. It is cigarette butts. There are billions, literally, of cigarette butts found in our oceans each and every year. It is a Scary statistic, but not one that we often think of and we have front of mind. And they're the ones you'll often see in the gutters around wherever you live. So it does make, unfortunately, a whole lot of sense. So that is kind of it for the presentation today. You can get in touch with me here. Um, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, online as well. You can check out Banish, Recycle with Brad that way as well. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'll keep this screen up for maybe another minute and then I will open it up to questions. So if you want to pop any in the chat, that would be great. I know that um, Rebecca already responded to Jenna's question about the source for the plus the microplastics, which is great. Um, but if anybody else has any other questions, then please jump in and let me know. No questions from anybody? Covered it all? Oh, here we go. It's just come through. How do you motivate change, just a small change in community behaviour to recycle better or to not use plastic bags? This is a really good question from Yvette. So for me, I think the easiest way to motivate people is to make it so easy for them that there's no reason for them not to. So really to take all of the guesswork, to take all of the grunt work out of there, just so they kind of go over to that bin and they go, yes, you know, I'm going to say no, or I'm going to use a boomerang bag, or I'm going to do something that it's really easy and really simple. I think it's, it's frustrating that often you do have to make it so easy for people in order for them to make a change. But that's going to be the first change that they make. And hopefully it's the catalyst for a lot more changes that also happen in their um, in their lives. So that is what I would kind of do when it comes to the community. I'm also a really big believer in a lot of education. So kind of teaching people why it's important to make those changes. So kind of rather than getting really angry at them and getting really upset and kind of saying, I don't know, don't you know that turtles are eating plastic bags every day? It's kind of to talk to them about kind of the positive impact that it, you, it's had on your life. So it could be something like, I don't know, today when I had my sushi, I bought my own reusable container and I saved a dollar. There's no mention there about plastic consumption. You're not getting angry at them, but they kind of going, oh, that's really cool. Like I want to save that money next time or I want to make it easier for me. So that's kind of what I do is I like to try and relate it back to that person, but also try not to get too cranky and too <laughs> angry at them. Um, we've got a question from Jenna. We heard when a bamboo brush ends up in landfill, it's a similar problem to plastic toothbrushes in terms of how it harms the environment. So a bamboo brush is better because of the microplastics that break down in use or are there greater benefits? So a couple of things, I haven't actually seen um, the study that you're talking about or the research that you're talking about, about the bamboo brushes. But what, what we want to do is we want to think about how long they're going to take to break down and if it's going to be a lot less than plastic, which it definitely is. And when they do break down, they're going to be breaking down back into a more natural material, not tiny pieces of microplastics so I would say that for me is the guiding light to kind of go what where is this going to end up what is it going to turn into and I would say for then you want to be looking at your plant-based materials 
just looking to see if there's any other questions. A couple of them are getting lost in the different um, chats. I've recently seen Red Cycle went into liquidation. Is there any other companies which recycle soft plastics in WA? To be honest, Carissa, I'm not entirely sure um, if there are any companies in WA that are doing that. Right now, I only know of two different companies, one in New South Wales and one in Victoria. So I haven't heard of any in WA, but I'm sure if anybody else has, if they could just respond to Carissa, then that would be amazing. Do you have any non-pod coffee machine recommendations for an office setting? So I was actually in an office today and they had one of the like old school, like, you know, when you're at like an American diner coffee pods that was like sitting there on the hot plate, just brewing coffee all day, every day. And then, yes, you've got the paper filters, but they're paper filters. So that's kind of what I saw in an, in an office today, which I thought was a really great and simple idea. I would say if you are in a office using the coffee pods, then really just make sure you're recycling them. There are some really great and easy schemes to get involved with with um, coffee pod recycling, in particular for aluminium coffee pods. Um, I think we're about to see a product stewardship scheme being rolled out very, very shortly. And as Carissa just mentioned, there is also the Nespresso um, free coffee pod recycling, which is like a drop-off in store, or you can also order some bags online and send them there and then a vet had said there are steel coffee pods as well which you can also um reuse too great lots of coffee lovers <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, so Rebecca's just raised the point about taking part in container deposit schemes. So these are starting to pop up all across Australia and it's a really great way for us to engage with community. It's a really great way as well for us to reduce the amount of litter that is also happening too. So great point. And then Rebecca's just also added into the chat, New South Wales alone, there are an estimated 350 million plastic PET bottles that are still going to landfill. And then Yvette is asking what is happening with the end product of return and earn plastic bottles. I think that would depend on the different organisation or where kind of if it was with Tomra or where, what kind of area it is, but it was my understanding that they're being made into recycled plastic bottles. Amazing. I'm going to stop sharing now, but if anybody else has any final questions, then please pop them in the chat or also reach out probably on Instagram will be the easiest if you've got anything or if you have a shower thought in the middle of the night and go, hang on, where is this? Um, I think this recording will also be going on the Plastic Free July website as well. So you can check that out as well. But keep on going. Keep it up. It's only day six. Um, we've got a long way to go in. This is the start of a lifetime. We're continuing after the Plastic Free July. So just keep on going and don't be disheartened. If you fall off the bandwagon, just get back on and get cracking. Thanks, everybody.